السلام علیکم So in the last lecture, I showed you a demonstration in which I had a beaker of water. This beaker of water was placed on a hot plate. Thermal energy was supplied to the hot plate. The temperature went up. The temperature was being monitored by a thermocouple and at the same time I had placed a small piece of semiconducting material inside the thermocouple, uh, inside the bath of water and I was constantly measuring the resistance of this material, of this semiconducting material and it appeared that with the increase in temperature, the resistivity of this material dropped somehow. Now this behavior is exactly opposite to what we observe for normal conductors. So conductivity sigma, which is the reciprocal of resistivity is one of those physical quantities which have the widest known ranges. For example, you can have insulators whose conductivity is as low as 10 is per minus 10 ohm meter inverse. And you can have the best conductors like copper and gold whose conductivities can go up to 10 is per 8 ohm per meter. So there are about 17 to 18 orders of magnitude difference between conductivities of different materials. And if I were to make a plot between temperature and the log of the conductivity, I will find this huge range of different kinds of materials at work. So I would like to plot the log of conductivity because Otherwise, it's impossible to capture what's happening in the huge range of conductivities. So if I talk about conductors such as metals, what happens to their conductivity with temperature? If the temperature goes up, what happens to the conductivity? The conductivity? increases. If the temperature goes up, the contact conductivity actually decreases. The resistance goes up. Now what's the reason for that? We know that the conductivity of normal metal in the Drude's model is given by n e square tau over m. Now tau is the average time between collisions. If I increase the temperature, I see that those electrons which are colliding with positively charged ionic cores, the collisions become more frequent because as the temperature goes up, this positively charged ionic core is now vibrating with a bigger amplitude. So the temperature goes up, this ionic core vibrates with a bigger amplitude. Higher the temperature, higher will be the amplitude of oscillation of this ionic core. By the way, the ionic core is fixed at, its, at an equilibrium position. What temperature does is that the ionic core oscillates about its equilibrium, the mean position. So when this oscillation is large, because the temperature is large, and we also know that as the temperature goes up, the energy of this oscillation goes up as 3 over 2 kBT, because there are 3 degrees of freedom. There are 3 possible trans, uh, oscillatory motions in the x, y, and z directions. 
and each degree of freedom contributes half kVt. So higher the temperature, higher will be the ionic motion. So now if we have a free electron, a mobile electron inside the metal, if the temperature is higher, there is a higher possibility of this electron colliding with the ion because the target cross-sectional area is higher. So as the temperature goes up, the average time between collisions goes down. So temperature goes up, tau goes down. So the collisions become more frequent. And as collisions become more frequent, the conductivity becomes more frequent. So if I were to plot the conductivity of metals on this graph, as the temperature goes up, the conductivity actually drops. So a graph like this would be obtained. The temperature is rising and the conductivity is uh, so, in my uh, graph, this is the direction of increasing conductivity. So, my temperature goes up, oh, oh, I'm sorry, my conductivity increases in this direction. So, the temp so if the temperature is to go up for a conductor, the conductivity has to go down. So, here the temperature is going up and I would like the conductivity to actually go down. So, temperature goes up, the conductivity goes down. As I increase the temperature, the conductivity is dropping, right? So, this is the zero of this is Uh, all right. The temperature goes up, the conductivity of this material goes down. And if the temperature is really small, what's going to happen to the conductivity? It's going to plateau off at some base value. So this is the graph for metals. In metals, what we observe is that as the temperature goes up, the conductivity drops. This is the direction of increasing conductivity. Now, at some temperature, which is 0 Kelvin, the, temp the conductivity does not really go to infinity. As we lower the temperature of the metal, the conductivity should really go up, should really go high. So ideally, this curve should really go high, it should approach large values. But this does not happen. It just falls down or plateaus off onto some datum level, sigma naught. The reason is that even at low temperatures, if we were to if we were able to freeze the motion of these ions somehow, there are always impurities inside the metal will which will act as scatterers, which will act as centers for collusion. The second point is that even if the temperature is zero, this ion will have some zero point energy. It will still be oscillating with some datum energy, with some reference energy, which is called the zero point energy. You cannot completely freeze out the motion of these ions. So even at zero kelvins, the conductivity will fall down at some basic level. So if this is the graph for copper, so this basic level depends upon the number of impurity centers inside copper. So there are impurities, that's why the conductivity does not go all the way to infinity. It just falls down at some basic level. If you have copper that is purer, so then what's going to happen is that the base level conductivity is going to be higher. So if you have pure copper, purer copper, the base conductivity at zero Kelvin is slightly going to be higher than the conductivity here. So this is the graph for impure copper, whereas this is the graph for pure copper. And this range for metals is of the order of 10 raised to 8 ohm meter inverse. So on a linear scale, the log becomes a linear scale. This range is about 7 or 8. So this is 10 to per 7 ohm meter inverse, this is 10 to per 8 ohm meter per inverse. So this is how the conductivity of metals changes with temperature. You increase the temperature, 
the scattering collision time goes down and that's why the conductivity goes down. So this is, this effect is seen here. You increasing the temperature, the conductivity is dropping. You can also have materials that are insulators at room temperature. But at a certain temperature, the conductivity really goes to infinity, which means the resistance really drops to zero. Suppose I have such a material at a certain critical temperature, Tc, its conductivity just shoots to infinity. Such a material is called a superconductor. So at, at temperatures below the critical temperature, the conductivity of the superconductor is infinite. It's not large, it's really infinite. The resistance is not small, it's really zero. So a superconductor can pass current through itself even without the application of a battery or a voltage source. And that current can persist inside the superconductor for ideally up till the day of judgment. It's never going to diminish. Uh, up till the point that the temperature of the superconductor remains below the critical temperature. For semiconductors, on the other hand, if the temperature goes up, the conductivity also goes up. So this, the, for semiconductors, the conductivity is really smaller than conductors, but the behavior with respect to temperature is quite the opposite. So you increase the temperature, the conductivity is going up. All right. So this is where the semiconductors, how the semiconductors behave on this graph. Likewise, glasses also behave like semiconductors. You increase the temperature, the conductivity also increases. And the glasses have a lower conductivity than semiconductors, and semiconductors have a lower conductivity than metals. If you have insulators, insulators have the lowest conductivity. So they would lie somewhere high up on the graph. The conductivity is lowest, about 10 is for minus 10 ohm meter inverse. So they would lie on this graph somewhere at minus 8, minus 9, or minus 10. And their behavior is like normal metals, which means that their conductivity decreases with an increase in temperature. But they would lie somewhere high up on this graph. So there's a huge range of different kinds of behaviors of different materials when they are subject to a temperature change. And the range of the numerical values of the conductivities is also large. In fact, electrical conductivity is one of those physical conductive, uh, physical quantities that show the largest span of numerical values. Okay. So, but the question is, why do semiconductors have this kind of behavior? Why does their conductivity increase with temperature? If you look at this naive formula, Ideally, if you increase the temperature, this scattering time should go down. And if this scattering time goes down, the conductivity should go, should go down. But semiconductors are actually showing the complete inverse behavior. Now we would like to come up with a description of how semiconductors really work. these symbols. 
then I know that each silicon core is bound to four neighboring silicon atoms. And there are four valence electrons. So each silicon atom will contribute four valence electrons to four neighboring silicon atoms and will form four covalent bonds. So this is a naive atomistic picture of how silicon is bonded to neighboring silicon atoms. And all of the electrons participate in the bonding process. Everything is nice and simple so far. However, this diagram is just a plain diagram. It does not show the tetrahedral symmetry of these silicon atoms. So we have to ignore that for a minute. And this is a diagram that is drawn at zero kelvins, at the lowest possible temperature. So this kind of material is called an intrinsic semiconductor. <clears throat> Suppose I dope this material with a group 5 element such as nitrogen or phosphor, nitrogen, all right? So I have silicon and I have one nitrogen atom. as far as silicon atoms that are bound with neighboring silicon atoms it is concerned. However, nitrogen has five valence electrons. So if nitrogen were to make a bond with silicon, you can do nitrogen inside the silicon matrix because the sizes of the nitrogen atom and the silicon atom are roughly the same. They are in the same period of the periodic table, although they are from different groups. So this nitrogen contributes five electrons to this matrix, but only four of them are participating in bonding with neighboring silicon atoms. Remember, the level of doping is really small. If you have 10 is for five silicon atoms, there is only one on average nitrogen atom. So the level of doping is really small. So even though there's a huge number of silicon atoms, the nitrogen atoms are far and few. They are very small in number as compared to the total number of silicon atoms. So what's going to happen is that once again, almost all of the electrons in the silicon structure, they are going to contribute to the bonding. But since the nitrogen has five valence electrons, one of these electrons will not participate in bonding. It will not become part of any chemical bond. So this free electron is now available for conduction. It just acts like a mobile sea of electrons, just like a metal. But then how is an n-type, this is called an n-type material. How is this n-type material different from a normal metal? A normal metal also has a sea of electrons, which are just mobile electrons that can respond to the signals that are given off by externally applied electric fields. You apply an electric field and the sea of electrons just sloshes in response. Likewise, here we also have free electrons. For every nitrogen atom that comes inside the silicon matrix at zero Kelvin, there is one free electron. So the semiconductor, the n-type semiconductor also must also act like a metal. We also have p-type silicon or p-type semiconductors in which you go with a group 3 element. Once again, all four valence electrons in the silicon contribute to bonding.
the three valence electrons in phosphorus also contribute to bonding. But now there is a deficiency of an electron because this phosphorus can only contribute three electrons, whereas four electrons are required to complete the bonding. So what we really have is a vacancy here. The bonding between phosphorus and silicon indeed takes place, but there is a vacancy, which I've shown by this open circle. This object is called a hole. And it's positively charged because if the if bonding were to be were to exist, then there's a deficiency of an electron here. So this is a positively charged center inside the chemical bonding framework. This positively charged center is called a hole. Now, if these three electrons contribute to conduction, so do these holes. Because what happens is that an electron from a neighboring bond can fall into this hole. And when the electron falls into this hole, recombination of the electron hole pair takes place. And when this recombination takes place, which I denote by this flash here, this flash in my diagram is going to denote electron hole recombination. That is an electron comes and jumps into the hole. So the hole is positively charged, the negative electron comes in, it becomes neutral, whereas a vacancy is created in this, at this side. So the hole in effect has moved from this position A to the position B. So by this hopping of electrons and taking up positions inside holes, we effectively have a migration of holes from one bond position to another. And this is how conduction takes place through holes. In the free electron case, which it corresponds to an n-type semiconductor, these electrons are free. They are wandered around inside the silicon crystal and they can respond to electric fields. If we have a positively charged hole here and we apply an electric field, an electron, this electron could respond to the electric field, but it will remain inside the bonding network. It will not be a free electron. However, while remaining inside the bonding network, it can take the position of a hole. And what in effect has happened is that the bond has migrated within the bonding. This hole has migrated within the bonding network. So we can have conduction due to free electrons and we can have conduction due to holes. So this kind of material is called a p-type semiconductor. And if we have conduction due to n-type Inside n-type materials, we can have conduction inside p-type materials. Now, this is the scenario at zero kelvins. But there are other processes that can take place when the temperature is elevated. All right. One process which is always taking place is that an electron can combine with a hole to produce and the two will annihilate. This process is called electron hole recombination. And when they recombine, they will produce a photon of frequency f. Why do they produce a photon? We'll learn about this in a minute. But this process is always taking place. The electron and holes can recombine as they recombine here to produce photons. So these photons can actually, they carry energy so they can actually heat up this crystal. And if these photons are off the correct frequency, they can also appear as visible light. This is actually how an LED works. A light emitting diode works by the principle of electron hole recombination. All right, so with this basic bonding model of semiconductors, I would like to make things slightly more complicated and more realistic. And I would like to talk about bands. Suppose I have a string, and on this string I attach a pendulum of length, some length L1, this pendulum is going to have a certain natural frequency, omega 1, okay, which depends upon the length. Excuse me, what is the Excuse me, what is the problem? Then what is the problem? 
Now suppose on this string I also attach another pendulum of some slightly different length L2. Now this pendulum on its own, when it is considered independent of the first pendulum, will have a certain frequency omega 2. But now I have a coupled system. In this coupled system, there is a string, a flexible string that from which uh, is are suspended two pendulums and both of them share a common support. Now this becomes a joint system now. And the natural frequencies of this system are going to change. The new natural frequencies of this system are going to be omega 1 plus omega 2 and omega 1 minus omega 2. These will be the two normal frequencies of this new system. Just as if you have a medium in which two waves are traveling, one wave has a frequency omega 1, could be a sound wave, the other wave has a slightly different frequency, omega 2, another sound wave. Now if both of these waves combine inside medium, beats are produced. We all know that. Now this phenomenon of beats means that you will have two frequencies inside the system. And the new wave pattern will look like this. So now this is a combination of two frequencies. And the frequencies are omega 1 plus omega 2 and omega 1 minus omega 2. Likewise, if you have two resonant circuits, if one resonant circuit is an R L C circuit, it probably you've already learned about. And this circuit has a resonant frequency omega 1 and I bring in another circuit of a slightly different frequency, resonant frequency omega 2. And I couple these inductors through a mutual inductance. This joint system will have a different frequency. It will have two frequencies omega 1 plus omega 2 and omega 1 minus omega 2. Now if you have an atom inside a solid, we know that the energy levels of the atom are quantized. We know that. So, if you look at the hydrogen atom, for example, we know that the energy levels go off as 1 over n square, where n is the principal quantum number. So, if I were to draw the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, and if I were to draw the potential inside the hydrogen atom, so this is the distance from the nucleus, what would the potential look like? What's the electrostatic potential that an electron sees inside a hydrogen atom? The potential is going to look like a Mexican hat. It's going to look like this. The potential is simply plus E over 4 by epsilon naught R. This is the potential at the site of an electron that is produced by a single proton that has a charge plus E. Right? We've already learned how, what, what the potential is. Okay? And if you draw this potential, V of R, this is what it's going to look like. So the electron sees a potential of this kind inside a hydrogen atom. Now the energy levels are quantized. This is the ground state at minus 13.6 electron volts. This is the first excited state, the second excited state, the third excited state, the fourth excited state, and so on. So the energy levels are actually quantized of an atom when we consider an atom. Now solid is made up of a large number of atoms, a really large number of atoms. And from the density of the solid we can find out how many atoms are there per unit volume. Now what happens inside the solid is we get a picture of this kind. Suppose I have a one dimensional solid. Now that one dimensional solid comprises nuclei which are spaced regularly apart because it's a crystalline solid. In a crystalline solid there is a periodic arrangement of the nuclei. So these are the nuclei or the ionic pores. Now on the side of each nucleus there is going to be a potential of this kind.
So this is how the electrostatic potential varies inside a chain of atoms, which is a one-dimensional solid. And we can extrapolate this concept to three dimensions. So this is the electric potential from one atom, from one isolated atom. Now we have joined many atoms together to constitute the solid. Now this is the electrostatic potential from one nucleus. Now the nucleus comprises the inner electrons as well, so it's the ionic core. So this is the electrostatic potential from one nucleus, this is from the neighboring nucleus, from the next nucleus, and from the next nucleus, and so on. And all of these energy levels, which are the energy levels of the electrons, are quantized inside these, inside these wells. So now what we have is many identical quantum wells that are placed close to one another. So if I have an energy level of an electron corresponding to atom A, so this energy level really corresponds to a frequency because every energy is a frequency. And if I consider the neighboring atom, atom B, if these atoms are really far apart, they're not going to talk to one another. But if these atoms are brought close to one another, the same coupling phenomenon that we've seen over there would also occur here. And this energy level is going to split into two. So its original frequency was E1. This frequency was E2. The two frequencies are now going to change. This energy level is going to split up into two levels. Likewise, this energy level is going to split up into two levels. This energy level is going to split up into two levels. So all of these energy levels, instead of being fine levels, they will split up into many levels because now one level is talking to another. They are close together and they are interacting with one another. And as a result, what's going to happen is that a continuous band of energy levels is going to be produced. So there are many finely spaced energy levels and this chunk of energy levels which comprises finely tuned, finely spaced energy levels, this group of energy levels is called a band. So inside the solid, bands are produced. Remember that this axis is the energy axis. So if an electron exists inside this band, it can be in any one of these energy levels. It can be in the lowest energy level, in the higher energy level, it can be in any of these energy levels. So if it's in this level inside the band, it will have higher energy. If it's in this lowest energy level inside the band, it will be, have the lowest energy. Likewise, you can have multiple bands that are produced inside the solid. And the number of energy levels, the total number of energy levels is going to be the same as the total number of energy levels in the solid, which comprised atoms that were really far apart. But splitting takes place and these bands conglomerate or they get close to one another and form bands. But we can have many groups of bands. We can have one band here, we can have another band here. So this band is, has a higher energy than this band and electrons can also get into this band. And you also observe that there exist certain gaps between bands. These gaps are called band gaps. So there are no energy levels inside the band gaps. So an electron can only have an energy that corresponds to one of these energy levels inside the bands. So it can have an energy level that goes into one of these levels inside this band or an energy level that goes into one of these levels inside this band. It can never be inside a gap. So this is just like a staircase. You can be on one, one step of the stair, but you cannot be in between. The electron cannot exist inside a gap. It cannot have an energy that's in between this highest level of this band and the lowest level of this band. So this is like a forbidden gap for the electrons. But it can have an energy that corresponds to one of these bands. So bands are formed inside solids because 
for the individual atoms there are quantized energy levels and when you bring these atoms close together to, co to compose a solid these band level these band these levels split and they form bands each band comprises a large number of equally spaced levels and electrons fill up these bands all right so this is the band structure this is a first introduction to bands the complete description of bands comes from quantum mechanics now we can describe metals semiconductors insulators on the basis of the band gap theory on the basis of this theory that we just highlighted here suppose i have remember there is another important factor that must be taken into account do you all know what the pauli exclusion principle is what's the pauli exclusion principle and how does it apply to bands now what i'm doing is i'm picking electrons from the solid and putting them inside the bands whether those electrons are participating in bonding or whether they are free electrons they have to go inside bands the energy of an electron inside a solid must correspond to one of the levels inside the band because these are the only allowed energy levels inside the solid for atoms we have levels for solids we have bands okay now if i if i consider a band here this band comprises energy levels closely spaced energy levels and i just exaggerated the spacing between levels now i have an electron i'm at zero kelvins okay so the electron would go to the lowest energy state there is no thermal energy available for the electrons to be excited to higher energy states okay so it must go to the ground state now which one is the lowest state this is the ground state so i'm drawing the electron by a pink color the electron comes in here but this solid has many electrons suppose it is a second electron where will that that electron go inside this band will it go to the same level it, you are at zero kelvins or will it go to higher level there is no thermal energy available for the electrons to go to higher level so where will it go it will go to the same level so you have two electrons inside this level now suppose you have a third electron that comes in where will the third electron go up to yes it will go in the next higher level because the pauli exclusion principle does not allow two electrons to have the same set of quantum numbers already we have two electrons here so the third electron must go into the next higher level but the question you might ask is hold on we have two electrons in the same energy level here so they must have the same quantum numbers but that's not the case they will have opposite spins so if we have two electrons that go into the same energy level that's totally allowed but it's only allowed in the case when they have opposite spins so this electron will have a spin pointing in one direction and this electron will have a spin pointing in the opposite direction so only two electrons can go into an energy level provided they have opposite spins and if you have a higher supply of electrons inside the solid they can go into higher energy levels and two electrons per level until you exhausted all the electrons in the solid and have placed them inside the proper energy level inside the band so even though you are at zero kelvin you have electrons that are in the excite that are in the higher energy levels okay so this picture only comes out from quantum mechanics from the pauli exclusion principle if you did not have quantum mechanics or the pauli exclusion principle all of these electrons will go into the ground state but that's not allowed so electrons fill up these bands in accordance with the pauli exclusion principle and that's how you build up the electronic structure of atoms inside the periodic table as well the hund's rule is a consequence of this the off bob principle is a consequence of this so now what we have how do we use this picture to describe what we have discussed so far for metals semiconductors and insulators yes uncha bolo
लेकिन हाँ देर वी आर कंसीडर अदर डिग्रीज ऑफ फ्रीडम लाइक दी ऑर्बिटल एंगुलर मोमेंटम एस वेल सो हे नॉट कंसीडर विद दी ऑर्बिटल एंगुलर मोमेंटम ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन्स ओके यस because it has no other option it cannot go into this into this energy level because then that energy comes from the is provided by the pauli principle the pauli principle states that the ground state energy is not necessarily the zero energy if you have solid at zero kelvin the electrons will have a huge energy there that is called the degeneracy energy the energy that just arises out of the pauli exclusion principle the pauli exclusion principle is a quantum mechanical principle that pushes two electrons far away from one another so if you have two electrons already occupying uh, a, a a story in the building then these two electrons will necessarily push the third incoming electron to the next level so this is a kind of outward pressure on the electron that comes out because of the pauli exclusion principle it's called the degeneracy pressure okay this is the same principle why we cannot squash objects if we why we why cannot we squash objects why cannot we just have this object and crumble it to non existence because once we increase the pressure on this object and bring the electrons closer and closer to one another there is an outward pressure due to the pauli exclusion principle that is the degeneracy pressure that prevents that from happening this is how black holes are formed this is how neutron stars when they collapse the degeneracy pressure becomes so high that the outward pressure creates a supernova explosion and a black hole might emerge from that so this is a quantum mechanical principle that exerts a kind of outward pressure a degeneracy pressure it prevents objects from being crumbled all together it prevents atoms from being collapsed okay so even though you are at zero kelvin the energy of the electrons can be really high it can go up to few electron volts so now how do we use this band picture to describe semiconductors metals and insulators Now I have this kind of material 
this conduction band is totally empty, which means there are no electrons inside this band. Now I place this material inside an electric field. I switch on an electric field E. The electrons would tend to accelerate. A force will act on the electrons and they will like to drift against the direction of the electric field. Okay? Which means their energy would like to go up. But here if you consider an electron, say on the top of the valence band, you've applied an electric field, it has no way to go. It cannot get into the gap. This is the gap because this is forbidden region for the electron. It cannot have an energy that goes into the gap. And the applied electric field is not strong enough to promote this electron beyond the gap because the gap is large. All right? So if this gap is four to five electron volts or higher, then a very large electric field is actually required to promote an electron that is at the topmost position of the valence band to jump across this gap. Such materials are called insulators. Insulators have a completely filled valence band and a completely empty conduction band at zero kelvins. And the applied electric field is not sufficiently strong enough in most cases so that this electron has sufficient energy to overcome this barrier and jump into the conduction band. If you increase the temperature, by the way, at room temperature T, the value of KBT, you should all remember this numerical figure, is 1 over 40 electron volts or 25 milli electron volts. So this is the thermal energy. This is a measure of the thermal energy. At room temperature, the uh, because of thermal energy, the electrons can acquire this much energy, 25 milli electron volts. But this gap is 4 or 5 electron volts. One electron volt is 40 times higher than this. So it's about 200 times higher than the thermal energy. The electrons, even at room temperature, do not have sufficient energy to overcome this barrier and jump into the conduction band. So such a material is an example of an insulator. And insulators have completely filled valence bands and completely empty conduction bands and large band gaps. Now suppose you have an intrinsic semiconductor like pure silicon. And you're at zero kelvins. Once again at zero kelvins, you have an intrinsic semiconductor such as pure silicon. Remember, pure silicon is the purest known element to mankind. We have never made anything that is purer than the silicon used in, inside our computers. For about 10 days, what 15 atoms, there could be one impurity. That is a thousand million million atoms is just one impurity atom. This is the level of purity that we've reached for modern day semiconductors, silicon technology. It's the purest known element to mankind. And by the way, it's an abundant element because its oxide is just sand. Silicon dioxide is just sand. It's a very abundant element. So we're lucky in that respect. Now, if you consider this intrinsic semiconductor, once again you have a valence band and a conduction band, and at zero kelvins, this valence band is completely filled and the conduction band is empty. Now, if you increase the temperature slightly, this band is small, this gap is small. For silicon, it's about 1.1 electron volt for silicon. And for germanium, it can be 0.7 electron volt. Now for a semiconductor material, a pure crystal, you apply an electric field. There are electrons everywhere, right? So this blue shading means that there are electrons. Two electrons inside a gap, inside a level, and you fill up all the levels up to the top of the valence band. Now you provide some thermal energy. What can happen is that one of the electrons can cross this gap 
and since there are empty energy levels here it can make this gap it can make this jump because the gap is smaller the thermal energy is sufficient so that the electron at the top of the valence band can cross the barrier it can overcome the obstacle which is the barrier and come into the conduction band now once this electron comes into the conduction band it is free and after the electron has gone away from the uh, valence band a vacancy is created so as a result of the jumping process a free electron a free charge carrier is produced inside the conduction band and a hole is produced inside the valence band so this is exactly the reverse of recombination in recombination an electron and a hole recombined to give off a photon here the exact reverse is taking place an electron hole pair is being produced because of thermal energy so this is an example of electron hole synthesis or production so if you look at this atomic level diagram what's happening here is that if you give enough energy to these electrons which are inside the valence band because they are contributing to bonding these are not free electrons in here you provide sufficient thermal energy this electron that was inside a band can now become free and it can wander around inside the crystal and in response to applied electric fields and contribute to conduction but at the same time once this electron has been freed you created a hole here now these holes can independently contribute to conduction so a hole has been created inside the valence band and a free electron has been created inside the conduction band because of electron hole synthesis so both of these free electrons and the positively charged holes can contribute to conduction so if you were to apply an electric field e you can have a current due to these electrons these free electrons electrons inside the the valence band are not free they cannot contribute to conduction once the electron has been freed and promoted to the conduction band can it contribute to to conduction a hole inside the valence band can contribute to conduction on the contrary so this electron can contribute to conduction so if you apply an electric field e i would like to find out what's the current i know that the current equals the charge on the charge carrier here this is just the charge on electron the number of electrons inside the valence inside the conduction band the drift velocity of these electrons which is just the mobility of these electrons times the electric field so this is the current uh, times the area this is just the current that flows inside this material due to the electrons but you also have current due to the holes so you have also a contribution due to the holes and if the carrier concentration of the holes is p then you have p is the carrier concentration of the holes inside the intrinsic semiconductor you multiply this with the mobility of the holes remember that the mobility of the holes will be in general different from the mobility of the electrons because they are traveling in different bands times the applied electric field times the cross sectional area through which we are considering the current so this is the total current through an intrinsic semiconductor and inside an intrinsic semiconductor if there are no impurity atoms you can quickly notice that n must equal p in an intrinsic semiconductor all the mobile electrons are cons have corresponding mobile holes inside the valence band so as many mobile electrons inside the conduction band so many holes inside the valence band that can contribute to conduction so this is what happens inside an intrinsic semiconductor material now if we increase the temperature this rate of electron hole synthesis goes up <coughs> so you have more and more electrons that are now being promoted 
to the valence band. And these electrons can come from the top of the valence band, they can come from the bottom of the valence band, from the middle of the valence band, they will produce holes in the valence band and they will produce more and more electrons inside the conduction band. These electrons can contribute to conduction, these holes can contribute to conduction. So N goes up and P goes up if the temperature goes up. When both of these objects go, go up, the current goes up in response to the same applied electric field which means that in effect the conductivity of this material is going up. So this naive picture of sigma equals m e square tau over m still holds true because even though this factor is going down because now the lattice ions are oscillating with a bigger strength, they are becoming more and more vociferous, the number of charge carriers is also going up. This does not happen for metals. For metals, if we increase the temperature, the number of charge carriers does not go up. The number of charge carriers just remains fixed as the carrier density of the free electrons, which, the, which are the electrons that have been freed from the ionic pores. But for semiconductors, you can create more and more charge carriers by increasing the temperature. So this is what happens in an intrinsic semiconductor. You increase the temperature, the number of the number density of charge carriers, be the holes or be the electrons, both of them go up. So this is what happens for an intrinsic semiconductor. For a metal on the other hand, you might have a completely failed valence band and you also have a partially failed conduction band. Even at zero kelvins. So at zero kelvins for a metal, you have a partially failed conduction band. What this means is that these electrons inside the conduction band, they see a lot of neighboring vacant energy levels inside the band. And if you apply an electric field, it's very easy for the electrons to make transitions to the next higher energy levels inside the same band because the next higher energy levels are placed really close together. The spacing between the energy levels inside a band can be of the order of micro electron volts, whereas thermal energy at room temperature is of the order of milli electron volts. So the spacing between these levels is really small. So it's just peanuts, so easy, so facilitated for the electrons inside the conduction band because they have nearby empty spaces. They can easily juggle around. If you have nearby empty spaces inside the class, you can easily juggle around even with a small push, you can move to the next chair. So what's happening here is the same effect. You apply a small electric field, these electrons have immediate vacant levels present in their immediate vicinity and they can move to these energy levels that are close by and contribute to conduction. Here, there are no immediate energy levels present in the immediate vicinity. So even if you apply a large enough electric field, the electrons have no way to go the electron must have some way to go inside the solid. However, if you apply a really strong electric field in here, you can have electrons make this transition and then this insulator can go into conduction mode. This is what is called, this is what is referred to as breakdown. For example, the breakdown of air can happen when this electric field is strong enough because of the applied electric potential that electrons can make this transition. This is called the breakdown effect. So these are the three different main classes of materials that can be described, the conductivity can be described on the basis of the band model. Now I'll give you a one minute break and then we'll move on to an interesting application of semiconductors.
all right, in an n-type semiconductor at zero kelvins, this is the conduction, this is the valence band, this is the conduction band. At zero kelvins, the valence band is completely filled, but still you have excess electrons because in an n-type material, those electrons are just free. They have no way to go inside the bonding. The bonding band, of which is the valence band, is completely filled up. So those excess electrons go inside the conduction band. And there are only very few of them because the number of impurity atoms is really small. The number of dopant atoms is really small. But these free electrons inside the conduction band can contribute to conduction. So even at zero kelvins, even though an intrinsic semiconductor cannot uh, cannot conduct sufficiently well if the temperature is not the temperature is zero kelvin, so it cannot conduct at all. However, at zero kelvins, an n-type material can conduct because of the presence of these mobile electrons inside the conduction band. Remember, an n-type material is this material on a whole electrically neutral. Is it neutral? Is it a neutral material? Is this an electrically neutral material? Yes. It is an electrically neutral material. Everything is neutral here. The atoms are neutral. The dopants are neutral. So if you take a small volume inside this material and look at the charge on side this material, it's going to be neutral here, neutral everywhere. Okay? Because this free electron is actually mobile, it's wandering around inside the crystal. So at one point in time, if you take a small volume, this element is going to be neutral. This is called quasi-neutrality. This is neutral, this is neutral. So even though I've drawn excess electrons here, it does not mean that the material is negatively charged. Likewise, for a P-type material, what we have here is a completely filled uh, uh, valence band, but there are holes inside the valence band that can contribute to conduction. So this is a p-type material at zero kelvins. Okay, in an intrinsic semiconductor at temperatures greater than zero kelvin, we know that this is partially filled. Is totally filled at zero kelvins, but if you increase the temperature, the electron can be promoted to the conduction band and they can produce holes inside the valence band and they can contribute to conduction. But the reverse process can also take place. That is an electron that has somehow been promoted into the conduction band, either due to thermal effects or otherwise, can come down and fall into a, into a hole. This is the process of recombination that I've talked about. So recombination between the electron and the hole can also take place. An electron can of course jump down from a higher band to a lower band and fall into the trap that is called a hole and produce a photon, produce energy. Because its energy is, come, is going down, this is a high energy state, it's going to come down, it has to produce energy. This energy, HF, can be inside the visible regime. And if the material or the device is constructed such that these photons can be extracted from the medium, this can produce a light emitting diode or even a laser if the conditions are correct. This is how we have light emitting diodes. Light emitting diodes emit light because of electron hole recombination. Remember that if the temperature of this material goes higher than zero Kelvin, then electron hole production can take place. So inside an n-type material, we can also have holes. There's nothing stopping us from having holes inside an n-type material. Likewise, inside this medium, we can also have electrons, mobile electrons inside this medium. Because this thermal generation of electron hole pairs is always taking place. Suppose that this gap is EG the probability that an electron jumps from the valence band to the conduction band is given by a Boltzmann factor which is exponent minus Eg over Kbt. 
If this gap is higher, then this probability is smaller. For insulator, this gap is really high. So the probability that an electron from the conduction band, valence band jumps to the conduction band is really small. Okay? So higher the gap, smaller will be this probability. If I were to plot this probability as a function of temperature, for example, I would get something like uh, something like this. Oh, right. If I plot this as a function of Eg, let's plot this as a function of Eg, I will get something like this. So higher the Eg, smaller is the probability. And higher the, if I were to plot it with respect to temperature, this is what I would get. Higher the temperature, higher would be the probability. Okay, so this is a graph with respect to temperature. Alright, so electron hole recombination and electron hole synthesis, both of them are taking place at the same time. If you increase the temperature, electron hole synthesis goes up. Higher the temperature, more electrons will jump into the conduction band because the gap is fixed but the temperature is higher. So the electrons here will have a higher propensity, will have a higher probability of making this jump across this small barrier. And when they come here, they will contribute to conduction, so the conductivity goes up. But if you have more electrons here and more holes here, the probability of recombination also increases. So at a certain temperature, an equilibrium is established in which the rate at which electron holes are recombining and the rate at which they are being produced remains constant. This is the condition of dynamic equilibrium. Now what I would like to start off with in, the, in these last 10 minutes is a, is a conceptual description of the PN junction. Because this is the basis for all transistors, MOSFETs, NPN, PNP junctions, PNP transistors, all of modern technology comes, starts from here. All right. Now I'm going to follow through a systematic approach. So please follow me very carefully. Suppose I have a p-type material next to an n-type material and both of them are fused together. Now it's impossible to have a p-type crystal and an n-type crystal and join them together by some adhesive or glue. This is not possible. So what you have is you have a sil single ingot of silicon and you grow this and at a certain point in time you introduce p-type impurities and this, as this crystal is growing you introduce n-type impurities. So it's not that an n-type crystal has been fused together with a p-type crystal. Rather, this is a seamless crystallographically continuous junction. It's one crystal. Here there is a higher doping of p-type material, here there is a higher doping of n-type impurities. Mm. So now if, we, if I were to represent the electrons by these filled circles, there is a higher propensity or a higher density of electrons here and a higher density of holes here. Suppose this is at time t equals 0. Now what happens is these are mobile charge carriers. These are also mobile charge carriers, the holes. They can move around. Now there's a, diff there's a concentration gradient. There are more electrons here and more holes here. So diffusion of these charge carriers takes place across the junction. Anything that is mobile, if it sees a concentration gradient, it has to diffuse. All right, like a gas, like scent molecules, like what you see in osmosis, what you see in diffusion, this is a, a natural phenomenon. Whenever there is a concentration gradient, there is a diffusion of charge carriers. All right. Now what we observe is that if the, if the electrons diffuse into this region because of the concentration gradient, and the holes diffuse into this region because of their concentration gradient. 
Initially, both of these materials were electrically neutral. But now, it has let away its electrons. These electrons have gone away and holes have come in. On this side, the holes have gone away and electrons have come in. So the electrical neutrality is broken at the junction. This region is no longer neutral, rather it requires a positive charge and this region requires a negative charge. So on this, on both sides of the junction, a positive charge is developed here and a negative charge is developed here. Now this positive charge and negative charge that has developed at both sides of the junction produces an electric field of its own and the direction of this electric field is like this, right? It's pointing from positive to negative. Let's call this field E J, the junction, inside the junction and still we have electrons here, an excess of electrons here and an excess of holes here. By the way, we also have some holes here because and some electrons here because of thermally generated electron hole pairs. Right? But the majority of electrons here and the majority of holes here. So now if an electron would like to make this jump across the barrier, across this junction, it has to go against the direction of the electric field. If, an hole, if a hole wants to make this jump, it, if it has to diffuse across the junction, it has to go against the direction of the electric field. Right? <clears throat> the electric field is pointing in this direction, which means that positive charges inside would like to flow to the left and negative charges would like to flow to the right. But what diffusion is trying to do is it would like to make negative charges flow to the left and positive charges flow to the right. But that's not allowed by the field inside the electric field inside this junction. So now as this charge is built up because of the initial diffusion that has taken place an electric field has set up, this is again electrical negative feedback and this new electric field that has set up prevents the further diffusion of charges until equilibrium has been established. So now after equilibrium has been established we have a situation like this. We have a p-type material and an n-type material, we have a junction. On this side, we have negatively charged, an excess of negatively charged charge carriers, which are called electrons. Here we have holes. And here we have a net positive charge. Here we have a net negative charge. And an electric field has been set up inside, which is E, J. And this electric field prevents the further buildup of further diffusion and everything comes to a standstill here. So electric field by negative feedback it prevents further diffusion. Now what happens is that this is just like a parallel plate capacitor but the plates are not of infinite size. Right? If you have plates that are of, are of infinite size the only electric field that exists is inside the plates. Right? There's no electric field outside. But in this case, these are finite sized plates. So there will be some fringe field outside the plates. Inside this region and inside this region. If I denote this fringe field by this pink color, the fringe field in this region is going to point towards the negative charge, e, this is EF. And here it's going to point away from the positive charge, this is EF here. So what this, uh, what this fringe field is going to do is going to move some of these holes towards the junction and holes will be depleted from this side of the, of of the device because they will move in response to this fringe field. So some negative charge will be established here. Slight negative charge will be established here because of this fringe field. Likewise, this fringe field will tend to move electrons in this direction. Electrons move in the direction opposite to the fringe field. So when electrons move away from this side, a slight positive charge is built up here. 
Now when this negative charge is built up here, this fringe field diminishes because there's negative charge here and there's some negative charge here. This, when this positive charge is built up, this positive charge will produce a field opposite to this fringe field. Eventually, this slight diffusion on, on these ends of the device will take place such that the fringe field goes to zero. Because an opposing field has, is actually set up because of these surface charges. E, F dash. And an E, F dash is set up here. Eventually, everything will come to a standstill when the fringe field has also disappeared. When there's no field here, the only field that exists is inside the junction, EJ. And there are really small negative charges here and really small positive charges here. And the electric field here is zero. There are still charged carriers here. The electric field here is still zero and there are some positively charged mobile poles inside this region. So once everything has equilibrated, this is the situation that we have. We have a PN junction, a junction has been made, there is a strong electric field inside the junction which has just been created because of diffusion. No other process, nothing systematic, random motion of the electrons but in, in, in a concentration gradient and of holes inside the concentration gradient that has produced an electric field inside this junction. Now what I would like you to do as a homework before we meet for the next class next week because on Thursday I'm not going to be here, there's going to be a review session led by Noman Sir, and on Friday there's going to be the midterm so I'll continue with this on Monday but before that there's a slight homework for you and it's a really important homework. What I would like you to do, I would like you to find out this electric field. Now let me give you a hint. What I would like you to do is, I would, if this is my axis, this point is x equals 0, this point is x equals d, and this is the midway point, x equals d by 2, and if the carrier density is rho, that is I have rho electrons per unit volume and rho holes per unit volume, okay? And my doping strength is 1 in 10 raised to power 5. And my density of silicon atoms is 10 raised to power 22 atoms per cubic centimeter. And my density of silicon is 2.4 grams per cubic centimeter. And the mass of one mole is 28 grams per mole of silicon. I would and for every hundred thousand silicon atoms, I have one impurity atom, which contributes to one mole and one electron. And from that, I should be able to calculate rho. Now, based upon this information, I would like to calculate the electric field as a function of x. And I would like to use Gauss's law here. There's no electric field here. The only electric field that exists is inside this junction. So before we meet next week, I would like you to come up with this calculation. All right, thank you very much and best of luck for your midterm.